Hi everyone, this is the talk about um, advancements in free IPA and we basically will report on a, a year-long work that uh, free IPA and SSSD teams did. Um, well, it's not the finished work, but it's um, something we want to share with the world. And um, let us start uh, with um, next slide and who we are. Um, both uh, me, uh, Alexander, and Trevinia, uh, free AP core developers. We are doing um, different parts of uh, IPA development and uh, we work at Red Hat for quite some time already and also contribute to Fedora and some other distributions um, in our work in spare time. Next slide. Um, free IPA itself is um, what we call identity management uh, solution. Um, it's kind of hard to explain to people. Some people are often see it as an active directory for Linux, but that's not really exact uh, comparison. But there are um, some things we try to do. We try to provide uh, centralized infra to manage uh, POSIX identities across a, a bunch of Linux machines. And um, we combine a bunch of um, other open source components like 3 nine ds LDAP server, MIT Kerberos, uh, Bind DNS server, SSSD, Samba, and we also have a bunch of Python codes uh, that constitute the um, free IP management tools. And um, in fact, um, free IP actually depends a lot on different uh, components um, in the uh, core OS and they work together and if something is not working right uh, this can be uh, really used as a canary to detect any kind of breakage in the packages uh, just uh, today we found that um, an update of um, OpenSL uh, PKS 11 package um, a minor version broke some of our DNSSEC integration in Fedora. That's kind of life we live every day. And uh, one of the bigger showcases uh, of, of Free APA is that many open source projects do use it as um, their own identity system. So GNOME runs Free APA behind the scenes and Fedora uses it behind the scenes of Fedora accounts as built on top of um, uh, free AP. Next one. And um, we, if we look at the um, uh, free AP at the operating system level, then we kind of provide three parts of uh, functionality. So first we give access to the um, POSIX information about users and groups, and that's done mostly through SSSD. And all clients enrolled in an IP environment, they run SSSD nowadays. And uh, authorization of the users to access certain things is also done by SSSD, uh, which parses uh, so-called host-based access controls, HBAC rules, and uh, decides whether allow or not uh, certain access. Then the um, authentication part is um, done differently depending on what what you want to have. Um, we certainly promote uh, Kerberos authentication uh, as the central one because it allows you to uh, do what often called um, single sign-on where you obtain um, a ticket grant and ticket um, initially, and then present it to obtain individual service tickets and access other services. So 
practically this is single sign-on to system services and we will show some of these uh, or consequences of using that um, in the Fedora environment. Uh, but also IP provides um, centralized management of different um, other attributes. So one of them is public keys for SSH access, which also uh, broker it through SSSD on the client. So SSH I can see um, that the user has this public key that is presented, is known to um, to the host because SSSD delivers it from the centralized place where a user places it. And the same happens for the host keys and so on. Um, but um, next slide. On the um, um, most important part of, of this uh, kind of presentation is how to integrate I, uh, free IPA or IPA as we call it shortly to non-operating system services. So this is um, typically what causes most of the um, issues um, on the mailing list when people try to integrate with various uh, web services or um, some solutions that include, um, let's say, email and other uh, tools that do not really uh, use um, POSIX environment concepts. They use their own concepts of users, groups, and access controls and so on, but they don't really rely on presence of those users or groups in their execution environment, like Linux system where they run. And for this one, the um, typical use is what we see in the next slide as the um, um, kind of use of free IP as a backend. So glorified um, LDAP uh, store where um, different applications try to uh, look up data. And uh, in many cases, it's just what they call LDAP drivers. So many uh, web frameworks, they have um, access um, for the identity with what they call LDAP drivers. But uh, some of the um, um, applications um, we work it with, uh, we made possible to, instead of going directly for LDAP server, um, use SSSD uh, as this kind of source. And um, Fedora accounts, for example, uses uh, Epsilon um, identity provider for um, its internal uh, kind of web uh, authentication thing. And Epsilon has a um, plugin to talk to SSSD, ask SSSD about users, about their attributes and groups they belong to, and then make decisions on it. Uh, similar thing exists for um, another open source IDP identity provider, Keyclaw project, which is based for um, Red Hat uh, single sign-on uh, product. And there are a few modules written over years uh, by um, Jan Padzora from our team. Um, for integrating this with um, Apache and Nginx uh, servers. So mod lookup identity or uh, a port done by one of his students uh, to Nginx, uh, this Nginx HTTP lookup identity module. They talk to SSSD and they um, have uh, quite sensible and flexible way of defining what you want to talk to. But that's identity. So who you're looking at. The authentication of it happens typically, again, through binding to LDAP um, and verifying that credentials passed uh, by the users are correct. Or using Kerberos with the um, uh, a protocol that uh, Microsoft extended when they needed to go with Kerberos uh, and single sign-on uh, in the uh, web world. Um, um, one colleague of us um, wrote this um, 
the Apache module, which I think named uh, incorrectly, it should be mod auth JSS API there. Um, but then there is a um, PAM authentication in, in both Apache and Nginx with the um, mod auth NZ PAM, which effectively allows you to use the um, SSSD PAM stack for all of this operations. The um, issues with the um, most of these modules is that authentication um, through those um, literally only allows you to take it at Kerberos or to um, username and password. And it's not interactive um, in terms of um, doing back and forth and asking additional questions and so on. And, and it's real big problem. Um, for years or maybe for decades already. So on the next slide, <clears throat> we have um, listed a few uh, disadvantages. And um, aside from technical things, um, really the, the one of the biggest problems is that um, application authors, so the people who write those applications, they really have problems um, working with LDAP and Kerberos. These are complex things, and I cannot blame those uh, people who misunderstand or don't work with them correctly, because it's easy to misunderstand what Kerberos does. It's easy to fail on security of your solution if you try to do everything yourself. So some frameworks do allow extensibility, but uh, some are not. And documentation about these protocols and specifically implementations isn't really great. It's um, quite complex to do um, secure and safe implementation uh, use of it. Um, so we, we tend to for reuse and, of course, um, typical integration struggles are um, like with LDAP, um, there are plenty of solutions where you can only specify a single LDAP server that promotes stuff like um, using um, or front end in LDAP servers with uh, some some sort of um, a solution that um, distributes the uh, requests uh, to the backend servers um, and um, that in itself is a security nightmare because that's the single place which uh, kind of should know all all the um, security credentials uh, for communicating with the backends and so on. And, and in, in many cases also uh, Java is used almost everywhere, but the Java frameworks, they have really outdated Kerberos support. Many features that were added uh, as a part of uh, free IPA um, involvement in Kerberos development, um, they simply have no support for those. You can switch Java applications to use um, system provided MIT Kerberos or Heimdall in Debian, but it's um, it's a pain. Uh, some uh, Commercial solutions do not allow this kind of switch and they do not certify these solutions. And therefore those Java applications do not see some of the authentication methods that we support and use and they simply not working. Then we, uh, when, when we were doing support for uh, key clock integration with SSSD, we found out that there's literally a huge problem with um, Java-based applications to talk over Unix domain circuits. You literally need to bring like 10 to 15 Java packages to just talk Unix domain circuit. So it's not maintainable. It's not really working well. And finally, with the microservices approach, you um, not really um, in a situation where you should assume that system-wide domain enrollment details like um, access to your Active Directory environments and so on is really possible to achieve. So it's it's always a problem that practically means, okay, you have to make a decision between being secure 
uh, scalable and um, and just working and take two of those typically so in past maybe 10 to 15 years there was a movement in the web services to have something that um, was expressed in um, so-called OAuth uh, authorization framework and um, OAuth 2.0 um, version um, provides a number of methods that actually rely on uh, they some of them are insecure but most of the uh, um, things that used these days they pretty secure if you use them right away and there are good solutions to do that much better than uh, for integrating with LDAP and Kerberos for web um, they rely on browser so HTTP protocol has feature for redirecting uh, a browser to talk to different systems and this redirection is not under control of um, um, at attackers often and um, can be used for reliable and secure operations. Um, that, that's also a disadvantage in a sense. So if we switch to uh, next slide, uh, of course the um, OAuth uh, authorization framework in itself is um, giving you a lot of adv advantages actually. And one of the biggest ones is that everything moves from application, which becomes OAuth client in this context, to identity provider, the, the place where um, this client talks to. So you have one place to focus instead of every single app. If your app is done with the um, OAuth or OIDC and all these things on top of OAuth authorization framework, then in your application, you don't really care how actual authentication happened. All you care is that you get a grant to operate and you formulate your application operations in terms of um, this grant to access user information. And these are all of two uh, subjects, not the system level users. So it gives a bit of uh, good flexibility to map these POSIX users that Free APA expresses to something else. They not necessarily should be POSIX users, but uh, and have access to resources on the hosts themselves, but we can simulate that in a sense. So, um, next slide. And uh, the other part, this was a backend. Free IP is a backend for um, all these external things. The other part is Free IPA as a consumer of external resources. So one of um, those is the consumption of external identities. And in Free IPA, we have uh, support uh, for trust to Active Directory uh, Forest, which is um, quite widely used. Um, but the, we also can consume authentication from, from those Active Directory trusts. And there is also another one. So. A classical, typical thing that you can have a radio uh, server somewhere in your network that your um, other equipment, network equipment, talks to, and um, it um, allows you to authenticate some of these users to um, Wi-Fi access points in your environment or some other place. But it also can be used to authenticate to systems. So we have integration with radios on the Kerberos level. So this is pre-authentication method uh, that basically allows to kind of proxy the request to the um, external radio server, wait for the answer, and treat that answer as a um, kind of a signal to uh, Kerberos KDC that the ticket needs to be issued. So this support has some limitations. Um, there's one radio server endpoint per each user. So only um, a scheme where you can pass um, pin plus token or just a password, really, 
um, to radio server and it, there's no conversation. You ask it, you got the answer, it's either yay or nay and that's all. The, you cannot ask again and, and go in, in cycles without breaking the user experience. Um, so we have this and we've started thinking, okay, maybe we can do something around this. And next slide. Um, we look it into, and, and okay, um, the um, all to basically says, um, all all to client uh, has no idea how user authenticated to identity provider. All of client simply asks, grant me, authorize me to access something to, to certain resources. And how IDP authenticates the user is beyond this. So if we forget about this and let the IDP handle actual authentication, all we need is to be able to trigger these operations and um, really um, go and um, make sure that our client and our server side um, is able to talk to IDP. But the problem is the whole OAuth 2 framework is built around a browser. And many IDPs, when you try to log in or do something, they enhance a user experience with uh, running JavaScript, running, um, using all the fancy things with the HTTP and HTML and um, web uh, assembly and so on. So there's craziness there. So how we can avoid running the browser on our side, on our server side, it's uh, all this thing is, 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 is a real nightmare. So last um, year at the Nest, there was a talk about doing similar OAuth uh, to authentication where uh, there was actually a, um, a project running on the server side, this um, temporary server where your browser would connect to, to perform this operation. And, and it's, a, it's a nightmare. You have to run this server on the server where you would log in into and you haven't logged in into yet. So it's, it's a, um, yeah, we went through this for several years trying to find out what we could do. And we kind of figured out that this is, uh, we already had this problem. Next slide, please. It's, it's really the same problem that we have with the captive portals. Captive portal want to uh, talk to you before you get Wi-Fi access. And if you want to log in on your system, like GNOME environment, you want to log in into GDM, uh, in the GNOME session, you have to run this before login happens. You have to run untrusted code in the browser somewhere. We still haven't solved this problem for the browsers how we can run this untrusted code to prior to login and, and so on. So we decided, okay, um, maybe we shouldn't solve this problem. <laughs> we will spend years solving it because the first time we were talking about this in 2015 uh, with the um, browser team and um, it was admitted that um, this is the um, issue the desktop guys were saying they are looking into this problem and they still look at it but it's it's tough to solve so we started looking into different parts next slide and before i go into the technical details trevinia will log you over ssh i think this is gonna be a uh, fun yes uh, in this demo i'm gonna um... I'm gonna show you something cool, um, but let let me let me switch to a different virtual desktop. Uh, so what you see in the screen right now is just a Firefox browser on the left and a regular console on the right. Where, as you can see, 
um, APA is already installed. So the packages and uh, it's already deployed. Uh, and this is uh, Fedora 36, as you can see. Okay, so um, in addition to that, I have some uh, pre-existing uh, users already in the system. So for instance, uh, if I user three, um, and this is a normal user um, where password is uh, set to true. That means that uh, this user has a password, okay? Um, and then I have two more. GitHub user. Uh, and then um, wh where the main difference with the previous one is that the password is set to false. So this it means that this user has no password. Um, in addition to that, for this particular user, we have a uh, pseudo rule pre-configure. Okay, I can show you that by running if a pseudo rule. We have the best rule. Yeah, as you can see here, the test rule um, is a pseudo rule and allows the GitHub user one um, basically to do all. Okay. Yeah, and then, um, yes, I, I think, yeah, we have another one. This is called Azure User 2. And this is pretty much basically the same as the previous one where the password is set to false. Okay, so um, keeping in mind that uh, this pre-configuration, I'm gonna log in into the system uh, first of all, using the IPA user 3. So then I run SSH IPA user 3. And then, as, as usual, um, everything um, is normal here. It's asking for the password. Okay, so I managed to log in and get a ticket. All right. So as I said, uh, until now, everything is normal. But then uh, for the next two users, I configure something as trying for APA and the login is going to be a little bit different. And that's because I added something that allows me to log in with credentials from an external IDP. So let's try. One. Match the same command and uh, yeah. There we go. Surprise. Um, I might, um, yeah. Now I'm not asked for the password, and then I'm asked to copy this URL and go to the browser and get that URL and then copy the pin. And insert it in the, in, the, in the URL. Okay, so this is also uh, um, doing the authorization for the user. Once this is done, I can press enter here and I manage to log in into the system. Uh, but this time with only password, as you can see. And not, not only that, um, if you recall, um, I mentioned that this, this user has a sudo rule, right? So let's try. We can test it with sudo l. And as you can see here, uh, this user is granted, has granted privilege for sudo for everything. Right? Um, and actually, when I use sudo, for instance, to create a folder, um, yeah, it's working and it's not asking, um, it's not ask, asking for, um, for the password again. Um, I don't get again the authentication prompt to validate the login again. All right? And I can show you why. If I go, if I exit from here, Okay. Uh, this is because um, basically we enable 
the PAM SSS GSS support, uh, we can easily check this by running off select command. Yes. And then, as you can see here, we have an extra enable feature, which is with GSS API. And this is what is allowing me to um, go through the authorization of the sudo without paying prompt again for the password. Um, and finally, uh, let's try with uh, different external IDP, such as Microsoft, so that I can use the other user we have. Okay, so again, the same thing, but now I'm redirected to uh, Microsoft URL. Yes, it's asking me for the code, the code is here, so all I need to do is copy and paste it. Yes. Okay, so the process is completed, then I can go back to the terminal and press enter here. And the SSH was completed, as you can see. And I got the ticket. So uh, with this, uh, now we can forget about the storing passwords. Uh, this is a, a fully passwordless uh, mechanism, uh, as we can associate uh, tokens uh, for non-administrative users. And then um, I think um, Alexander can give you more details now about how this is working. Uh, Alexander, do you, do you want me to show something else? Yeah. Um we can get back to the um, slides, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah. This. Yeah. So next slide. So basically, what you have seen is an implementation of the um, OAuth to device authorization grant flow. This is effectively um, a way to support dump terminals like our SSH, which cannot talk HTML and cannot be browser. Um, this is being done by um, basically offloading the browser task to um, a different device. So let's say it, it is your phone or your other computer or maybe the same client um, system that you're used to run SSH, but certainly you have this browser on it, not on the system where you try to uh, connect to. And um, in the case of uh, Free APA, the actual implementation is a bit more complex than this one, but rem remains to be uh, similar to this. So on the next slide, you can see an uh, actual um, way of doing it. And the um, um, this um, the box in the middle um, is actually not the system where you run, where you initiate your um, SSH um, communication. It's instead a free API server. The um, server runs uh, Kerberos KDC and that Kerberos KDC uh, performs something similar to radius authentication by calling out uh, a helper. We call it IPA or TPD because it handles one-time password and radios in the same system. And now it handles also um, OAuth authentication. And it reuses um, another helper that is provided by SSSD, um, which is OIDC child there. And that child is what talks to the um, um, external IDP. So somewhere in the, um, in the cloud or on other system, uh, there is an um, identity provider that has um, support for device authorization grant and so-called device code portal. And the message that you see on the client side uh, by the Kerberos actually um, is um, by the Kerberos client is the message provided to you by the um, identity providers uh, to point to the device code portal. And then your browser is going there um, to talk there. Um, David is saying that he needs a bigger screen. Uh, don't worry, um, these diagrams, they 
um, in free API documentation and um, this presentation has links to it we will provide it so you will you will see them yeah um, so it's it's all there um, in the um, design docs and also in the workshop so major part of it will go through the workshop in in the um, <clears throat> implementation so the actual flow that happens there if we get to the next slide is um, that the um, SSSD does uh, implement uh, a special pre-authentication module called IDP. So it, this client uh, pre-authentication module on the Kerberos side tells Kerberos KDC, oh, yeah, I support this uh, OAuth method. Consider it. And KDC may consider it by uh, checking the details about the user. If user has um, mark that it can use IDP and certain IDP is associated with it, then KDC will respond with the message and ask you to authenticate a specific URL and press enter afterwards. So there is some communication, um, as I said, with the IP RTPD, um helper. We get uh, communication several times, ask the uh, IDP uh, to uh, verify these credentials, wait for user to authorize the um, or grant us to, to use resources, and on successful authorization response, we issue Kerberos ticket to the user. And user runs browser elsewhere. It, we still have to have a browser there. That's unavoidable, but at least it's running on a system where user most likely has the browser already. And this Kerberos ticket is a normal ticket um, on the next slide um, where it could be used for anything. So the, the only thing that we do um, additional there is we associate authentication indicator with this um, ticket based on the uh, method that, that was used for pre-authentication in Kerberos. So if that was radius method, we take radius indicator. If that was uh, smart card authentication, we use um, uh, PKI in it as, as indicator. And for external IDP authentication, there's new indicator called IDP. So basically what was shown by Trevenia is PAM SSS GSS using the Kerberos ticket and um, his configuration was actually uh, insisting that the Kerberos ticket must contain an IDP indicator. And because that user, GitHub user one, had IDP indicator in, in the Kerberos ticket, it was allowed to access uh, sudo. You can use that for uh, model of GSS API as well, because this Apache module also supports indicators um, in, the, in the code. So that's possible type of integration. We switch from externally authenticated and authorized user to a Kerberos ticket, and then Kerberos ticket can be used for normal system level and maybe uh, web applications. And indeed, with free IP, we don't have support for all to log in into the web UI that we have for IPA itself. So you have to obtain the ticket first and then log in into the web UI. Um, next slide. So this all stuff was tested against uh, a number of uh, public identity providers. Uh, we tested against Kicklock, found some bugs in the, uh, the device uh, authorization grant flow implementation, fixed it. Uh, then we tested Google, GitHub, Azure, Okta, all they work. What doesn't work, and actually the um, IDPs that do not implement device authorization grant, which is fun, but that's the reality. So GitLab is using some Ruby-based um, library for uh, all the implementation that doesn't have support for um, device authorization grant. And Ypsilon, which is what Fedora accounts is using, is 
also have no support for device authorization grant. I hope we will get this uh, fixed um, going forward, but this is the state of uh, affairs nowadays. Next slide. I'm trying to speed up a bit. Um, and this is the um, second demo. Okay. Yeah, so let's jump into the next demo. Um, so what, yeah, let me switch to another virtual desktop. So here what you see this time uh, is uh, three brochures instead. Uh, the one on the left, it corresponds to Next Cloud and it represents uh, a customer framework application, okay? Then on the right side here, um, we have a key clock to be used as our identity provider this time. And then finally, the third one is simply the VPA web UI. Um, and then on the background, I simply have a terminal terminal log into uh, the VPA server. Um, so what I'm going to do now is to create um, a new user in our main provider, which is click clock. Here, I'm going to click on add user. I need to log in. Okay, so I will call it um, ITES2, for instance. Okay. Okay, this is creating a user. And then I can see it, how it's created here. I can even um, uh, reset the password. Right, password has been created. And as you can see here, suddenly the user should appear in free APA magically. Yeah, there we have it. I test two is there. All right. This is because KeyClock is somehow connected to free APA. And, and now, actually, I can use this user that I just created to log in into the customer application, to log in into next cloud using KeyClock. This is going through the OpenIDC uh, framework. Okay. All right. As you can see, um, next cloud is using um, KeyClock as provider of identities. So then, then it's redirected to KeyClock to do the authentication. There, here, you can write ITES2 with the password activated. And there we go. I log in into the customer application. So it was able to authenticate using the blog as provider, as um, a user that is at the same time populated in free APA. And then a user that has access to systems that are managed by, by FreeRPA. Okay. Um, so in addition to this, I think we can configure OAuth2 uh, for this particular user. We can go to the uh, IPA console and then uh, we can write this command to enable the user for um, uh, kick off uh, as external um, IDP. So the user is I test you this time. Authentication type is going to be IDP. All right, and the external IDP is kick lock. Okay, so with this command, we're indicating uh, to the I test. I, I, I think you need to modify the um, external user identifier because you put it uh, I test instead of I test to IDP oh. user ID here. Yeah. So you need to do user mode again. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm, I'm missing this one. Thank you, Alexander. 
otherwise it wouldn't match the um, ID of this user on the geek log side. Yep, exactly. So yes, as you can see, we, we modified the user, the user that we created in Keyclock, and then uh, we are uh, uh, adding the authentication type ITP, and we are using the uh, standard ITP configuration Keyclock. Okay. So now, if we try to log in into into, the, into a system by using this S2 user. It should get a similar, yeah, there we go. It's asking me to go to um, key clock and provide the, the device authorization code. Yeah, this is asking for the code, which is here. Yep. Okay, so this is ready. Then we can go back up the center. And as you can see, uh, um, I managed to uh, log in into. Um, so I can show you the, uh, the standard IP indicator that uh, Alexander was mentioning before. Um, I can basically do this command. This is need again to authenticate. Repeat the operation. What Trivini is doing is actually using Kerberos uh, utility directly instead of going over SSH. So um, the yeah. ticket that he got there is the ticket from um, is the Kerberos ticket directly, and you can see if you do k k list dash capital c that this um, c cache contains um, configuration detail that shows the pre-authentication method that was used for um, actual authentication mm -hmm. and 152 is the um, idp method that we created it's registered uh, upstream and uh, in the system so um, MIT Kerberos knows about it, and SSSD package provides it. <clears throat> okay, we have three minutes left to so the formal time and a few more slides here. Uh, but basically what you saw is um, a generic backend dream, I call it. So there is this um, set of RFCs and, and effort to define how cross-domain identity management should be done. So it's kind of a, um, a, a protocol over REST API over HTTPS that allows systems to talk to each other using the definitions of what users are, what groups are. It's called Scheme, Scheme V2 for sure. And we implemented a uh, proof of concept uh, tooling that sits between the um, uh, identity provider and free IPA or actually LDAP server or Active Directory domain on top of SSSD uh, and uh, performs this scheme uh, V2 translation. And next slide. And this is how it looks. The um, project was um, uh, published today. Uh, it's called IPA Tura. The tool is um, ice chisel uh, in Finnish. Um, a tool for, well, type of ice chisel. A tool for breaking ice, uh, for making um, access to the uh, water in winter. So <laughs> effectively making um, a bridge between water and air, um, between uh, those two systems, the web and uh, classical ones. The current scope is um, fairly small but uh, powerful. So we support free APA, LDAP, and Active Directory for reading through SSSD and writing through IPA API uh, in Python. There is rudimentary password authentic authentication support with PAM um, modules. So you kind of can have passwords in IPA 
stored or in LDAP and Active Directory and SSSD. If it authenticates you, then uh, let's say Keycloak will accept this as authentication. But in this example, in the demo, we used password on the Keycloak side and kept uh, IP clean of those passwords. So next slide. And uh, this is published in free IPA slash IPA to run um, on GitHub. Yeah. And we really <laughs> want to see people coming and testing this against other stuff. And um, for connecting this to Keycloak, we have um, a Keycloak storage uh, plugin, user storage plugin um, by Justin Stevenson. So it's it's working well, but it doesn't have much of functionality yet. So we're really at the proof of concept uh, point. It it works, uh, but uh, obviously needs more work uh, to to be a production ready. And um, I think this is all we have. Right? There are some future plans. I'm gonna get through them quickly so that uh, we can have some Q and A. So next slide. Um, so, the, yes, the idea is to actually have a, a transparent bridge completely between IPA and OAuth uh, IDPs so that we can have some stuff like IP enrolled apps like Cockpit uh, on each server to accept OAuth authentication of IPA users somewhere and log in these users uh, into Cockpit or into web UI that FreeIPA provides and then securely uh, tra transit from OAuth grant to Kerberos on behalf of the user. You can do this insecurely nowadays, but we don't want uh, to compromise. We want to have something that really ensures that the um, there is no token stealing and, and so on uh, for, for the um, particular thing. That will take time to get through. Then we um, kind of have on the next slide, um, a way to work with the FIDA2 um, tokens, the WebAuthn tokens. Um, you can already do this in Fedora 36 with, um, if your IDP like Keycloak or actually Google and GitHub and uh, Azure and Okta, they all support WebAuthn now. So you can do tokens uh, like the uh, YubiKey tokens um, with through your IDP. We don't need to do anything on our side, just that your browser has to support this. And that's all. But we plan to have FIDA2 tokens natively. First, locally, with Leap FIDA2 uh, to replace PAM UTF uh, module. And we work on this um, with some community uh, members. This is not yet uh, at the way um, it could be tested or something, but hopefully SSSD folks will get um, there soon. And then once it's ready, we integrate this with Kerberos for free APA so that um, all these things can be used um, uh, centralized way in, in the IPA environment. Um, then next step is to integrate with GNOME login so you can get there with all this stuff and finally get totally passwordless except maybe admin account um, on IPA deployments. Mm -hmm. And finally, with the um, <clears throat> Scheme V2 support, the IPA tour needs a test against other Scheme 2 providers, support more IDPs, add more authentication methods, because we really need to do Kerberos and some other stuff as well. It's a lot of work, but I hope we generate uh, enough interest to uh, to see community coming and, and helping us. So with this, um, thank you for listening. Um, and it's quite late here. Um, uh, let me look at the uh, questions. There are two questions, both from David. Um, how does this solution scale over large systems? Um, uh, it is um, basically uh, um, a single process per uh, single uh, request. Um, it's launched and forgotten. So 
that process runs until it uh, finishes communication. Um, the um, uh, IDP side of the um, of the story is um, fairly scalable, I guess. Um, like GitHub or uh, Azure handle millions of these authentications and so on. And um, on IPA side, um, it's fairly lightweight. So basically, libcurl with um, JSON um, processing and, and so on. So shouldn't be quite high. Um, for the uh, other question that David asked, whether there's is prioritized on uh, Epsilon side and on the uh, CPE, I have um, no idea yet. Uh, we need to talk uh, once we have something to um, to use with. Um, it's a chicken and egg problem uh, for the integration. Um, we will see. Yeah. Any more questions? Or we finish. Okay. If you have questions, just feel free to ask them on free API users mailing list. I guess this will be a, a, a good way to um, have a discussion about possible um, scenarios and use cases people are interested in. And thank you for listening. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of Nest. <laughs> <laughs>